Hi, this is Phil Leach, and uh, before we get on with this teaching, I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for uh, joining us on staff. The truth is, a course like this uh, really depends on you guys. The success or the failure is connected to the relationship that the, the student has with the staff person. I actually did a my whole undergraduate degree through distance learning a number of years ago and I learned then the the importance of the tutor, the connection and uh, in my experience it often wasn't very good and I, I miss that and it really is my desire that for uh, the online SBS there's a really good strong connection between the staff we have and their student and so this uh, teaching module here is an opportunity for me just to express my heart in this matter also in uh, how I've put the course together why I've done what I've done uh, I've done this out of over 30 years of involvement with the, the SBS and it's, it will be helpful for you to see some of the areas of potential weakness with this course and what I've done to try and strengthen that. But first of all and foremost, again, thank you for being willing to join the team. Thank you for being willing to serve as students, above all serve the Lord in this way and take the experience and the blessing that you've gained through your SBS and sharing that with others. The encouragement you bring, the input, the training, the teaching, all of these things that we will talk about in uh, other videos, these things are crucial. So uh, thank you. Now the uh, first thing I want to say is that uh, about the uh, approach uh, we have in the SBS, the inductive approach, and then the method that we use to apply that approach. The phrase I hear described, uh, that's used to describe what we do mostly is the inductive method. And uh, I think this has come very much now into the vocabulary of the SBS world and I can't imagine this will change but it's important that we understand that when we use this phrase, we're actually using a phrase that is a little bit unfortunate because the phrase, the inductive method, it, 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 I guess we could call it a bit of an oxymoron. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't work. It's a bit con self-contradictory because you can't have the inductive method. There's many methods out there to study the Bible inductively. Of course, methods of Bible study may or may not be inductive, uh, but we talk about our method as if it's the only one. Uh, but of course, even in the SBS, we use many methods. And so uh, I prefer to talk about the inductive approach. This is the thing we do. And I'll explain more why that's the case. But um, I guess uh, we have to understand the inductive method as an idiom. Uh, that is a phrase that doesn't exactly say what it means. The thing is, you will remember from your own SBS, one of the very first things you learned was there were two approaches to Bible study the deductive approach and the inductive approach. Now, if you've been around me at all, you'll know that sometimes I talk about the devotional approach as a third approach. And the reason I do this is because for many students, uh, they don't study the Bible inductively or deductively. Their experience of Bible study, if they indeed do any, is more uh, a devotional. They would maybe read a few chapters and their desire is that God would speak to them in some way through those chapters. But 
uh, as far as study is concerned, the two approaches, as you've learned, was deductive and inductive. Uh, and the approach has to do with the mindset that we come to Scripture with. Are we bringing our ideas to the text? Or are we letting the text inform us about what we're saying, or what it's saying? And you know the, the value or the foundation on which the SBS is built is indeed the inductive approach to Bible study. It's that mindset where we come as learners, where we want to the, be, to the best way we can lay aside our preconceived ideas and let the text speak to us. Uh, and uh, uh, rather than us trying to bring our ideas to the text. And this is the uh, non-negotiable when it comes to the SBS. Our approach to the Bible is inductive. The point is, there are many methods of studying the Bible inductively, which is why, why the phrase, the inductive method, is a little bit unfortunate, because there's not one, there's many. Uh, as I said earlier, the methods may or may not be inductive, but what we want to do is employ those methods, uh, and there's many, that will enable us to approach the Bible from that inductive mindset. So the approach is how we come to Scripture, that mindset of letting the uh, Scripture speak to us, but the method is how we actually study. And there are many methods to study the Bible inductively. Uh, for example, other ministries uh, are involved in inductive Bible study. You may have come across some. Uh, the Precept Ministry International, for example, they uh, employ the inductive approach to Scripture. Uh, their method, if you look at their material, is uh, different from ours. Although, of course, there's common elements, uh, and there's common elements to all of these uh, different uh, ways of uh, studying the Bible inductively. Um, there's another method you may have heard or even used where you approach the Bible inductively, but the method you use is you get your piece of paper and you have three columns. And at the top you write, uh, observation, interpretation, application. And then in the left-hand column, you would write your observations for the paragraph, and then you uh, write your interpretations and finally your applications. Now, this is a very simple method of uh, approaching the Bible inductively. Into thy word ministries is another inductive Bible study ministry and it uses four columns. The into varsity inductive Bible study method, they like all of uh, these would have the uh, basic steps of observation, interpretation, application, but their method will be different to ours. Maybe you've seen the Bible, the inductive Bible study Bible, and in that Bible there's a whole method that is incorporated whereby people can study uh, the Bible inductively. So I'm sure you see my point. Very simply, the different approaches are, are deductive or inductive. Ours, uh, is, the foundation is inductive, but indeed there are many methods, not just one. Now, the steps of inductive Bible study, as I have said, are pretty standard uh, among all those who are engaged in inductive Bible study, and that is you learn to observe well, interpret accurately, and apply in a way that is life-giving relevant into this situation. And so these steps are, are fairly standard. But it, when it comes to our method in the SBS, we have a method that is 
based around five readings and through those five readings we employ four different ways of what I've called recording our discoveries. Now there's many ways that we could uh, record the things we learn and certainly we have to have a way, simply a notebook or, or a loose leaf binder or something but the genius of the SBS method is that everything we do helps the student engage with the inductive approach. Everything. And uh, the reason I think it's important that we make a distinction between the approach and the method is the approach is non-negotiable, but the, the method that may be different a little bit different from one to another. So when it comes to the online course, uh, I've made a distinction between the approach and the method uh, by beginning to focus on the student learning skills to study the Bible inductively to learn the inductive approach. In other words, uh, learn to observe, interpret and apply and in the first unit uh, and the other units, the early units, I've, I've begun with that focus. So module one, for example, simply introduces the students to the basics of inductive Bible study and uh, different ways of, of thinking about this with the, the um, importance of observation and then interpretation and application and then uh, talking about figures of speech and laws of composition and, and the various questions that could be asked in these different uh, areas. All of this is to help them understand the basics of inductive Bible study which is observation, interpretation, application. And then with Philemon the idea is that they apply those um, three steps. Uh, at this time we're not talking about vertical chart paragraph titles, we're simply, I'm simply wanting them to grow in skills of observation, interpretation and application and the assignments you will notice are questions and those questions are designed to help them engage in these different areas. Uh, with Titus, uh, the same thing. I begin with uh, them uh, observing, interpreting and applying Titus, again using questions. I want to reinforce the skills that they've been learning. And uh, the idea of this is that we add information little by little. So I want to build a foundation of understanding the inductive approach, the importance of reading whole books, asking questions, thinking through uh, what is actually there, thinking through what did this mean to the original audience, uh, thinking through what does this mean to us today in these three basic steps. But then the second part of Titus, I introduce the ways that we in the SBS record the things we discover and talk about the, uh, the whole method that we use. And in this I talk about the, the ways we record our discoveries. Of course there's the vertical charts and to get the vertical charts you need to understand structure and paragraph titles and creating a rough horizontal and then from that getting that approved and then working on the BRI as you're uh, working through uh, your various observational readings, putting your BRI together and then finishing with a final application. And so it's in the second part of the uh, at the, the third unit that we get into the... Now, I hope I don't need to 
convince you with the value of this method. Uh, certainly if you have questions I would love to talk with you and uh, answer any questions because for me as I've worked with this over the years and seen students engage with this over many years this method really uh, powerfully lends itself to help the student with the inductive approach working through uh, the, the steps of, of inductive Bible study. Uh, but um, uh, some of the values of course is a really clear and concise way of recording the things they find. But it's not just a record, uh, it's uh, actually everything they do to record their discoveries is helping them walk through the steps of inductive study. Now, in the SBS world, you may know there's very different ways of doing the SBS method. Certainly, of course, it's clear we're all from the same family. Uh, there's uh, different readings and paragraph titles and vertical charts, horizontal charts. But when it comes to the mechanics, different SBSs will do it slightly differently throughout the world. And uh, no doubt you've come with your ideas of how charts should be done because you come out of your own experience and your old school, own school background. The question is, when we have staff from so many different SBSs, then we can end up with a, a kind of a, a clash of, of different ways of doing some of these things. And the question is, which method is best? Just a little bit of information for you about the history of how these things developed. Dr. Earl Morey was asked to uh, set up the school. Uh, he was a pastor in Virginia and didn't feel he should leave his church to join YWAM and he recruited Ron and Judy Smith and so they were the first leaders and uh, the pioneers of the school. Uh, but the way it worked in the early days is that uh, Earl Morey would come and do the seminar of the SBS. Now that is the history of the seminar. Uh, Earl could only come for three weeks uh, and he could only leave his church for that length of time so he had to fit everything in to that three weeks. Now uh, that's not the case now in many of our schools. The people teaching don't leave so we don't really need a seminar and the teaching of everything could take a bit longer and be at a more measured pace but with the Earl everything had to be packed in to these three weeks and uh, they as you know if you've had that experience there's a lot of new material in a short space of time. Nonetheless uh, he taught the first four, four schools and then uh, after my staff year in 84-85 uh, I came to England to start the school there. Ron and Judy they uh, developed their own seminar and I developed my seminar and then Earl um, was involved in the school in Washington and so uh, the, the seminars began to develop just a little bit differently and then out of those schools came people that took what they had learned from the seminar involvement in these schools and they ended up developing it further. I know that uh, Vila in Switzerland is the true inheritor of the Earl Morey model and uh, I designed my own syllabus. I read other books on Bible study and developed uh, my seminar and Ron and Judy I know did the same especially with a lot of input from trainer and others as well and so although it's all basically the same nonetheless there's these differences that emerged and over the years people have added and uh, uh, refined the the whole teaching and how charts should be done and, and the problem is that sometimes it can be overdone. 
Uh, for example, uh, when I did my school, there was no colour code reading. There was the first reading, the survey reading, and then the second reading was a, a, a second observational reading, seeking to go deeper in the area of observation. But uh, there was no teaching or instruction about colour coding. Uh, that was something that has emerged later. Now, interestingly enough, I did sometimes use colours. No one told me to, but I found it a bit helpful. I didn't have any particular scheme. Sometimes I didn't use colours, I just used a pencil. And I found that kinesthetic activity helpful in that second reading. But what has happened over the years that in some streams the uh, the colour code reading has been so developed that there's almost like a, a very detailed instructions as to what questions should have what colour or what symbol should be added to it and the colour coded reading can become really a burdensome thing. I know someone who took at least seven hours to read the book of Acts with the colour code reading because they were uh, so intent on using so many different colours and of course you can end up having your text so marked that it's hard to recognise anything. And so uh, is colour coding good or bad? Well, it depends the kind of person you are. Uh, in the online course I speak about colour coding. I recommend it to those who would find it helpful but I don't present a scheme and it's not mandatory. It's really, does it help the student? And if it does, then it's something they can uh, develop uh, on their own and it is something that will serve them. What about paragraph titles? Well, there on the screen is a copy of the, uh, of the syllabus I had about paragraph titles and you'll see that really there was two rules, four words or less. Obviously it had to be a significant title for that paragraph, uh, but uh, the main thing it was words from the text and four words or less. And the reasons of course is we want it to be an observational title, not interpretive, and we want it to be a, a title, not a sentence like a handle of a mug, some way you can get hold of that. Now, over the years, people have added more rules. Uh, I'm sure these have been done to help the student. Uh, I, I remember hearing of one syllabus that had seven rules for their paragraph titles. And uh, the problem is uh, we can end up robbing our students with the uh, from the, the beauty of engaging with scripture because of all the rules that we put on them and I really don't want that and so uh, in the syllabus you'll notice that I simply have they should be four words or less from the text and if you find your student is struggling to have good titles then of course you're free to coach them in whatever way you think would help them uh, the idea is to help our students come up with good titles. You'll see there a picture of the uh, vertical chart that was in my syllabus in 1983 and I think we've come a long way from that. Certainly not all the developments in the SBS have been bad. Many of them have been very necessary and very good and I think that the uh, the charts that we were presented with are not so helpful for recording our discoveries because the boxes are so wide. Uh, we need more space on the outside. But whether the, uh, the box is in the middle or to the left, whether uh, the uh, observations are on one side, the interpretations on the other, uh, however it's laid out, the, the, the point is this is the student's worksheet. That's how we think of the vertical chart. It's their worksheet. And they then, having drawn up this chart, should be able to use it in a way that's really going to help them engage with the text of Scripture 
and record the things they've discovered and that will be different for di different people and we need to just acknowledge that and help them uh, make it their own. Now there are some non-negotiables that I will talk about and why they're non-negotiable but what we want really is the students to own these. And so the charts are the students' records. I remember a time when uh, at the end of the school many years ago, a student went outside and at the end of the school he burned all of his charts. Uh, clearly for that student the charts weren't his work. They were just something he had to do to please the staff to get the grade. And if that was all they were, then why bother to carry them home? Why not just dump them? But of course, that is not what we're after. We want them to be able to use these charts later, to go back and refer to them, and to be really useful. But of course, we do have to grade their work too. And so there are certain things that need to be in place so that we're able to grade and evaluate it. And we'll talk more about that later too. So the mentality is the charts of the students' records. Uh, we don't have them jump through unnecessary hoops of of uh, details with the method. Uh, they're not filling out forms or writing an exam paper for us, but it is their work. We as a staff, as I've mentioned, do need to know uh, if they're observing, interpreting and applying well and to be able to evaluate that. So uh, we will uh, want them to indicate uh, what they're doing in that, relation, in, in that regard. And also uh, later in uh, the next video we'll talk about rubrics, uh, which is a standard whereby you will be evaluating their work and grading it. And a rubric is a, a mechanism whereby they know what it is you'll be looking for. And so there'll be no surprises with that. Uh, just before we come to the end of this video, I do want to mention the key verse. Uh, the key verse is a, a bit of a strange animal in the sense that as we are thinking of inductive study, the key verse is not strictly inductive. And uh, especially, uh, we must not talk about the key verse. Uh, because the key verse indicates that there's a certain verse that if the student finds it, they f they, they've got it. Uh, or or maybe there's just one or two acceptable key verses. Now, uh, I remember sitting around years ago with my staff and we would uh, be thinking about the next book and the structure, the horizontal, and uh, we'd look at the different uh, horizontals that people had and, and the key verses, and, and then they would be the acceptable key verses. Problem with that, of course, we don't know whether they're very good or not. And... Uh, and if you only have a few key verses that are acceptable, then the student quickly learns not to be engaging with the text, the scripture, to find a good key verse, but rather uh, what they do is they will be trying to guess what you have in your mind. And uh, we don't want them to do that. So uh, although the key verse is not strictly inductive, in other words, the human author inspired by the Holy Spirit was not... Uh, thinking about key verses when he wrote the, his, his, his work, uh, it really is a useful aid to study. And that's really why we do it. Because if we get a, a verse or a couple of verses that uh, sum up the book, when students go back, they look at that verse and it really is like a key that opens a book and uh, uh, helps them remember the message and, and, and so much of what's going on there. And so uh, it's, a, it's a good aid for study, but there's not one that is necessarily good. So when it comes to the key verse, and uh, we want a student to be thinking about the elements uh, that should be included in, the, in that verse to sum up that book. 
and for you to as a staff person. When you're looking at a verse or a couple of verses, do, do, do those verses or does that verse have the elements that summarize the main message uh, and what's going on in that book? If they do, it's a really good one because what we want is the, the message encapsulated in that key verse. And so when we come to key verses, it's not so much that there's right or wrong, but probably we should think of it as a continuum. There's lots of verses that wouldn't be good. There's maybe some that would be quite good. And then there'd be those that would really do a great job in summing up that particular uh, book. So uh, you won't be given verses by me to say that these are the ones that they must have, uh, but rather you're able to engage with your student and the text and hear what they have to say and see whether that verse is a good one.